Hello, my name is Vasilios Kuzmakos. Today is October 6th. I'm here speaking with Dr. Um, Kent Vliet. All right, so to start off, um, I was just, just wondering if you can tell me about where you were born, if you can describe your family for me. Oh, okay. So I was born in Oklahoma and grew up in Norman, which is uh, the, a university town. It's where the University of Oklahoma uh, is. My father was a professor of law there. And uh, so I basically spent my whole life living in university towns. Um, my, as I say, my father was a professor of law. My mother was a, originally a concert pianist. And then she was uh, one of the first female faculties in the School of Music at, uh, at the University of Oklahoma. And then, um, she taught piano uh, all through my childhood. I have uh, three other siblings. Um, my brother is an international lawyer. He lives in Tokyo. Um, my two sisters uh, still live in our family home in Oklahoma. Fantastic. And kind of going off that, right? I was just wondering if you can describe the type of activities that you did in childhood. Sorry, I just had some uh, interference here. So uh, no. can you repeat that question? Yeah, of course. Um, what type of activities did you do in your childhood and how did you kind of develop a love of nature? Was there any particular event or person? Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, there's a story there. Uh, when I was young, I got interested in, uh, in animals and uh, natural history and I gravitated toward uh, reptiles mostly, but um, amphibians some as well. So I caught snakes, I caught lizards, that sort of thing. Um, I learned a lot from books. And so uh, even by the time I was in, in junior high school, I had a pretty good knowledge of natural history and, and some biology. Um, uh, by chance, more or less, I ended up in a in a long car ride with um, a fellow who was the previous president of the University of Oklahoma. Uh, and the fellow was a, a botanist, and in talking, he realized I did know quite a bit. And so um, I was 14 at the time, but he made arrangements for me to be able to work in the research labs in the zoology department at the University of Oklahoma um, in the afternoons. And I did that um, from the ninth grade until I graduated from high school, uh, working with uh, researchers and doing some of my own research. Um, I ended up staying at the University of Oklahoma for my undergraduate, um, but uh, always working with reptiles and and uh, never really venturing into other animal groups. I came to Florida to work with a fellow named Walter Offenberg, who was the curator of herpetology at the Florida Museum of Natural History at the time. And he's a very well-rounded biologist. He's probably best known for his work with monitor lizards, including uh, the Komodo dragon. And uh, so I had, uh, I had been working on social behavior in, um, uh, crocodile, in uh, geckos. And um, I'm going to turn off my uh, email here. Sorry. So I'd, I'd been working with social behavior, social displays in geckos. And so when I came here, uh, to to originally do my master's research, that's what I was hoping to do, and I spent a bit of time looking uh, looking for a good gecko project and didn't really find one. Um, Dr. Offenberg had ju had uh, just spent two weeks watching alligator courtship behavior at the St. Augustine Alligator Farm. Um, at their invitation. And um, so while I was looking around for a project, I took his notes that he had, uh, had taken while he was there. 
and analyzed those and decided that was a, a good project for me. Um, so then I had to, once that decision was made, I had to go to the alligator farm and, uh, and convince them to teach me how to catch alligators because I, I was going to be working with this large population of adult alligators and I needed to know who each individual was for the behavioral observations I was making. So I needed to tag them for identification purposes. And so they, they did, they, they took me out in the lake and showed me how to catch them. And, and uh, I think within a few weeks, I, I probably knew how to catch those big animals better than they did because I was doing so many of them. And um, um, so I had 165 alligators in the lake. So it was a lot of work. I didn't do it by myself. I would bring volunteers over from the university to do it. We'd catch them and measure them and sex them and weigh them and put these big yellow cattle ear tags like you, like you see in the pastures here. I put those on the scales on their tails so that I could have a number associated with each individual. And so once I started catching alligators, I was just hooked. Uh, it's, it's an adre adrenaline rush. And, um, you know, I, I just wasn't really interested in doing anything else. So, um, and I really haven't done much else but work with alligators and other crocodilians for the past 40 years. So talk about how the, so talk about how that interest has evolved then, right? So you start with the alligators, now, this, um, now, can you just tell me a little bit about uh, how you kind of transitioned, you know, into crocodilians and other type of, you know, reptiles like that? So I started, uh, I was working with alligators, with a captive population yeah. of alligators, studying courtship behavior and other social displays. Uh, at the time, the alligator farm was, was really little more than a, than a roadside attraction. Uh, but over the years, um, beginning with the, the first few years that I was there. And um, what, years are, what years are these? So this was uh, beginning. I first, I went out over and caught my first gators in 1980. And then I did my research for my, then it became my PhD in 1981 to 83. And so in the period up until and I, I finished my PhD in 87, in the spring of 87. So um, during that period of time, uh, I was interacting with other zoos and as well as the, the owner of the alligator farm and the staff there and, um, and was encouraging them to get a greater diversity of crocodilians in the collection. And uh, it took a while. We did get a few different species in, and so I started getting experience with other species. Um, but um, it, it wasn't until the late uh, 1980s that the alligator farm bought a very large collection of crocodilians uh, from another facility. And uh, within the next few years, uh, the early 90s, we had built the collection at the alligator farm to where we had every, every known species of crocodilian on display. It's the only place that had ever done that. And, and we maintain that. Well, we, we still maintain those same species. We've just been doing work uh, on, um, on wild crocs and recognize that some things we were calling species were actually groups of species. So there are actually more species now than we have on display right? because you have these closely related forms where we don't have all of them. And how many species um, are there? How many do you identify? As right, right now we recognize 27. Uh, but there are more. We just have, we're only recognizing them if 
if the descriptions have been published and accepted by the scientific community. So when I started back in the early 80s, generally people felt like there were 20 or 21 species. So we've already grown that quite a bit. Uh, and I'm, I'm quite sure that um, by, you know, within the next 10 or, or maybe 20 years, we'll probably recognize at least 30 and maybe as many as, as 35 species. Because there's a lot of these species that are closely related and look almost identical, but genetically they're different from one another. And this is globally speaking. Yes. Correct? Yeah. And there's only uh, in Florida, there's only two native species. Yeah, there's a Florida alligator and there's the crocodile, correct? Right, the American crocodile extends into southern Florida. There's also an introduced caiman in South Florida, the brown caiman. Fascinating. So, um, you know, so you kind of mentioned how you really started doing your work with alligators in the 80s, right? Um, I was wondering if you can kind of talk about the kind of history of conservation of alligators, right? That are listed as the, you know, endangered species in the 1970s. Kind of big, um, so can you tell me a little more about that? Sure. Um, I got in a little bit, uh, got into crocodilians a little past the real peak of, of, uh, of the conservation movement. So alligators are, you know, often kind of held up as the, the poster child for uh, the Endangered Species Act and, and protection of, and, and recovery of endangered populations in the United States. And um, the alligator was, was never severely uh, threatened with extinction. There were probably still a few hundred, uh, maybe several hundred thousand uh, alligators throughout their range. Uh, by the time they began to receive protection. Uh, they weren't living anywhere near people, though, because any, any gator that lived near a human population or lived in an area that was easily accessible had gotten killed. There was a period from, uh, you know, roughly the end of the Civil War in, you know, in 65, 1865, until about 1965 or, or more toward 1970, where alligators were just slaughtered by the millions uh, for their hides. And, uh, you know, we don't know what the population was before that started, but it was probably uh, several million uh, uh Maybe, maybe 10 million or 12 million or something like that. And it was probably down to the order of 300,000 or 400,000 by the time they really got protection. The, the way the Endangered Species Act came about was that there, were, there was a, 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 a real concern by wildlife managers in the southern states that the alligator was going to be lost. And they were trying, they were enacting state laws to protect alligators, but without federal laws, all a poacher had to do is get the skins from those animals over a state line and they weren't able to prosecute them. So they needed federal protection. And so, in, uh, in 1969, there was an amendment to uh, a, a, a federal act called the Lacey Act, which it originally, it, it, it banned the interstate transport and commercialization of, of certain wildlife species. It was basically aimed at mammals and birds. It began at the time, at the turn of the 1900s, when uh, when egret feathers were egrets were being killed for their nuptial plumes, the fancy feathers they grow during courtship, they were being used in women's hats, and egrets were being wiped out in the Everglades, and there was a big public outcry about that. Uh, but at the time, nobody thought anything about reptiles or amphibians. So in 1969. 
a number of reptiles and amphibians were added to that, including the alligator. And that made it illegal for poachers to transport illegal products across state lines. And if they were if they were convicted of that, that was a federal crime, not a state crime. So it really had teeth, and uh, uh, and very quickly the organized poaching rings that occurred throughout the South in Louisiana and Texas and Florida just closed down. We had a few people went off to prison. And the others decided it just wasn't worth it, and uh, and they stopped uh, stopped the widespread organized poaching of alligators. And um, and so alligators actually were already beginning. There was pretty good evidence that alligators were already beginning to rebound at the time that the uh, Endangered Species Act was finally enacted in 1972 and 73. Um, so, and, and the alligator probably didn't need to be listed on the Endangered Species Act at that point because they were already protected and, and were their populations were rebounding, but the alligator had become this poster child of the Endangered Species Act and the, and the legislators that were pushing that through did not want to remove it from the list because that was kind of their, their star, you know. Uh, and so um, within just a few years of the Endangered Species Act being passed, alligators started becoming numerous enough in certain areas that they were becoming a problem. Um, in, in areas like southwestern um, uh, Louisiana, um, they, had, they had protected very large tracts of coastal wetlands, for, mostly for waterfowl protection, but they, they also protected the alligators that were living there. This was actually initiated by a guy named E. A. McElhaney, whose um, whose uh, family business was the Tabasco sauce business uh, uh, on Avery Island in Louisiana, but he was a great uh, promoter of uh, of conservation of of wildlife, and he had donated a lot of money along the coast of Louisiana, a lot of land, I should say, and encouraged the protection of others. So those areas actually, during this period of intense persecution of alligators, those areas still held a little nucleus of alligators in them because they were protected. And so when all of the pressure was taken off of alligators, those places became a nucleus for the alligator reproduction and the spread of alligators. And, uh, and so those parishes in southwestern Louisiana became the first to really start experiencing the problem of having too many alligators and alligators causing trouble and getting in the places they didn't want them to be in. And so they actually began petitioning uh, to, to downlist alligators just in certain specific areas to remove them from that federal protection, still, still protected, still regulated, but letting wildlife managers be able to go in and remove animals or move animals. They spent a lot of time catching alligators and moving them to areas in Louisiana that were to pop for it, or even to surrounding states. They took thousands of alligators to Arkansas and Mississippi, especially, I think into Alabama also, northern Alabama, and released those to try to build the population back up in those areas. But over the next few years, including in Florida, finally, by, by the late 70s, we were having problems with alligators and we were having to have our game commission wildlife biologists catch these animals that were causing problems and hauling them out into areas where there weren't any people and releasing them. 
So this just kind of slowly spread and more and more places were being downlisted to a, th a threatened status um, uh, until ultimately, you know, it wasn't until actually the late 80s and 90s that most of the range states were downlisted. So alligators are now still on the endangered species list, but they're listed as a species, uh, uh, a species of special concern because, um, and that's really meant to protect other crocodilians because um, when hides are in, um, in products like a woman's purse or a shoe or something like that there's such small pieces of skin it's often impossible to tell which species that piece came from so if they were harvesting alligators and making purses out of them there was the opportunity for people if they were so inclined to take skins from illegal crocodilians and feed little bits of them into their products so they got more more bang for their buck and um, and so that's the situation we're still at that uh, that alligators are no longer endangered but they're still protected throughout their range by state and federal laws fascinating um and uh, kind of based off that question, I was wondering if you can discuss the importance of alligators on swamp ecosystems, specifically the role of alligator holes, and, um, and if you can just explain what they are and what they do, and you know what would happen if they didn't exist. So alligators are big animals and they're powerful. And unlike many animals, they're able to actually shape or reshape the environment in which they live. And so we often refer to them as ecological engineers because they can open up clogged waterways. You know, if you have a waterway that's choked with hyacinth or something like that, they can force themselves through that. Uh, and uh, if you have water that's uh, during drought and you have rivers or wetlands that are drying out, they can dig down to wherever the water level is, deepen that water. So there's you know, a water available for all sorts of uh, animals. In certain habitats, um, and the most famous is in the Everglades, alligators produce these, uh, what are called alligator holes which are really that. They're, they're basically a pool in the middle of a more or less flat wetland uh, that's been dug down. These are most striking in the Everglades because the, the, the surface uh, of, the, of the ground there is not, is not soil. It's this uh, fossilized, decaying coral. So it's basically lime rock and it's fairly hard, but it is decaying some, so it can be broken up. And alligators are able through their digging actions to actually break away this lime rock. And all the alligators trying to do is get down to wherever the water is so that they can hydrate themselves and keep themselves cool and, uh, you know, and keep from dying in, this, in the summer heat. But the impact is that they, they open these pools and make surface water available for all sorts of organisms that, that would otherwise die or have to leave the area during those periods of drought. So they're a classic example of what we call a keystone species. Their, their presence in the environment allows many more species to exist there than would otherwise. The remarkable thing about the alligator holes in the Everglades is this, is this lime rock cap on them. Uh, and it's not easy for alligators to break through that. So, and these holes may be, you know, 40 or 60 feet wide. So, you know, they probably represent many generations of alligators working on these holes. It's not just one alligator that spent 
you know, a couple of years digging a hole. It's it represents hundreds of years of alligators during periods of drought getting in there and deepening those holes and until they can get down to the water. But they are a very important um, presence for um, all the other species there. That's not true in every habitat. Um, alligators don't big, build these big alligator holes in every habitat, uh, but uh, like, like in, a, in a lake. But they do. Um, Alligators uh, also dig burrows or dens for themselves, uh, either to overwinter in when it gets cold, they seek refuge from those cold temperatures in these basically digging a tunnel back into a river bank or the edge of a, of a lake. Uh, and they'll go in there for the winter. In the summertime, when it's really hot, water temperatures will heat up and become, they may, they may actually kill alligators in some cases, but, but it's uncomfortable for the alligators. So they'll move back into their den during the daytime when it's hot and forage at night. So alligators basically become nocturnal in the hottest part of the summer. And they're more diurnal during during the cooler parts of the year when they need access to sunlight for body heat. And how would you, uh, would you make any association between the alligator holes or their role as ecosystem and their role as, you can, as ecosystem engineers with uh, improvements or kind of like stability and water quality within these systems? So certainly water quality is affected uh, by the fact that they do very often uh, keep water moving through a system. So you don't get areas of stagnation and, and overheating where you get the loss of oxygen and that results in you know, fish or other organisms either leaving the area or dying in that area. By their actions, by their moving around, they're actually breaking, breaking uh, through impoundments so that water keeps flowing uh, in those areas. Th those are important uh, actions. They're remarkably powerful. They, uh, I've been in, in some uh, marshes here in North Florida that the soil is basically uh, three and a half to four feet of of peat, of you know, decaying plant matter before you get down to the sandy bottom there. And so it's, it's kind of the same situation as the Everglades. When the waters recede, they just percolate through that lime rock in the Everglades up in North Florida. They percolate down through the peat and the, and the water is not available to the alligators and other animals there. So alligators will just shove themselves down through that peat and you, you'll find them down under the peat between the peat and that sand where the water is. But in moving around down there, they actually lift the peat up off the bottom and, and eventually break it loose so that when the waters return, this peat floats like a cork. You'll get this big piece popping up that's maybe 20, 20 or 25 feet across that the gator had wallowed under. And, uh, and that then just kind of floats off. So now you have a hole through the peat that the gator lives in. And you also have, uh, when, the, when the water levels settle, those, those little islands that were floating around settle on top of the existing peat. So now you got a little high point in the middle of the marsh, which is perfect for alligators and freshwater turtles and things like that to nest on. Would it also be fair to kind of say that, you know, that disruption of peat kind of almost helps with nutrient kind of distribution of the ecosystem because you're taking this nutrient mass and, you know, sending it downstream and also, I mean, even the recharge of water, right? Because it's like you're allowing water to hit the aquifer through the limestone a lot quicker. 
Would that be a fair assessment? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, all of that is true. Alligators are, are interesting animals because they are amphibious. They spend a lot of time in the water, but they also go out on land to bask. And at times when water becomes scarce, they'll go cross country to find another body of water. And so they're actually quite important in, in nutrient cycling in the in environments in which they live because they're eating things in the water and then they're depositing those nutrients on land as they defecate or they may eat something on land. You know, they'd be hunting along the edge of a lake and eat a bird or uh, chase down a raccoon or something like that and go back in the water and deposit nutrients there. So they actually form a, an interconnection in the nutrient cycles between the land and the water uh, uh, environment ecosystems. Um, and they actually, we, we now know that uh, the same sort of thing occurs in our coastal islands. So they're actually shuttling nutrients between the coastal islands and the salt marshes, the tidal marshes um, uh, surrounding those. So they're going out there and they're eating crabs and horseshoe crabs and snails and mullet and things like that. And uh, during, during incoming and outgoing tides, but then they got to get back into freshwater ponds on these coastal islands because they, they can't uh, acquire too much salt. They don't have glands for ridding themselves of salt, so they have to sit in fresh water. So they're shuttling nutrients back and forth between coastal islands and, and saltwater marshes as well. Yeah, that, that's absolutely incredible. Um, so then kind of, you know, circling back a little bit, right, would you mind discussing the importance of, you know, swamp ecosystems and a role in ecosystem health? So what exactly do swamps do, right, um, you know, to kind of help water quality and to kind of, you know, help us essentially? So, so what, uh, swamps are extremely, I, I should say marshes as yeah. well as swamps, maybe marshes more so are extremely important in, in water quality, water purification. You can sort of think of them as giant coffee filters. So they're doing more than just physically filtering the water because those aquatic plants, those uh, emergent aquatic plants, the floating plants uh, are actually extracting certain minerals uh, potassium, uh, you know, phosphates, um, nitrates, nitrites, those sorts of things are being drawn out of the water uh, by the plant roots for the use of the plant. And so the, the longer the water is sitting in that environment, the cleaner it is from, from excess uh, um, mineral loads. And, um, and so, you know, there was a time when people did not appreciate the value of wetlands and, um, you know, many wetlands, many wetland uh, properties were dried, had water blocked from them so that they could be turned into grasslands or rangelands for for livestock, for cattle and, and other livestock. And, and we lost a lot of the value, the ecological value that these marshlands uh, give us. And so um, and that's, that's a, an, another valuable reason uh, to maintain those is because they're really doing a huge ecological service in purifying water. And then that water is typically trapped. A lot, some some uh, marshes are associated with the, the borders of rivers and streams. And so that water, you know, will flow back into the river and, and be carried down into the ocean. 
but a lot of these are actually flooded basins and there's no outflow to them. They're receiving an enormous amounts of rainfall, rainfall uh, into that area. They're acting upon that water and cleaning it, but then that water is, is settling and, um, and you know, ultimately uh, sinking down into the aquifer and recharging the aquifers, um, many of which we use for drinking water. So uh, those are very important areas and need to be protected. So in kind of circling back, right, how, would you, how do you think that the role how do you think the, the designation of the um, of alligators as a protected species has helped save you know or um the, these wetlands um from destruction? So um, there's a uh, there's a number of ways alligators have protected wetlands. Um, probably the the most important. Um, role that they play is an indirect one in the in the in in some sense the the philosophy behind the protection of uh, the conservation of alligators and other crocodilians has uh, in many places including the united states has has been a sustainable utilization of the alligator or other crocodilians because of their value for hide and meat and, and so forth for local economies. Uh, and it's, it's by giving the alligator ecological value by allowing some alligators, a managed population um, has a certain number of animals that are allowed each year to be removed either by hunts or by the collection of eggs and hatchlings that go to farmers, um, that gives the alligator an economic value. Alligators in the United States, I haven't heard these numbers recently. They may have been impacted by, uh, by COVID and uh, so they, they aren't necessarily current, but generally uh, alligators in the Southeast United States um, have about $54 uh, million dollars in commerce associated with them each year. So that doesn't just make alligators valuable. It makes the wetlands in which the alligators live have an economic value as well, because a large number of those animals that are removed each year are removed uh, as eggs or hatchlings. So we've got to have those wetland areas in which alligators reproduce, females build their nests, lay their eggs, and then those eggs are collected and they're hatched out in farms and they're grown up and they're, they're harvested for their products. And so we obviously have, um, we have uh, legislation that protects wetlands from development, uh, in, especially in places like Florida, which is an ever, ever growing human population, ever growing development. I'm not sure the value that the alligator imparts on a wetland would be enough in a place like Florida to protect a wetland. But in many places like Louisiana, for instance, uh, the value of the alligators living in bayou, you know, in coastal marshlands, many large tracts of which are owned by private individuals uh, who have to pay taxes on that land. You know, the value that they receive by uh, being able to sell alligator tags to hunters that want to come catch alligators you know, basically makes it possible for those families to continue to keep those lands for another generation or for future generations. And so there's a, there's a very clear benefit to, to wetlands from having alligators in those areas, even though it's an indirect one. There are other important aspects, you know, as I mentioned their their ability to open and maintain uh, waterways and, and water flow through it. 
the recycling of nutrients in the soil as they move around and maintenance of deep pools allows uh, all the other organisms that live in wetlands to persist and they all play an ecological role as well. So, um, you know, I know, so you kind of, you have kind of laid out a very optimistic, you know, kind of what kind of future, right? For the way kind of conservation has been happening with alligators and everything else, right? But, uh, you know, I'm kind of just wondering though, um, have you have you noticed any major changes in ecosystem, um, in ecosystem composition within your lifetime, right? So anything negative um, as you've kind of studied alligators, have you noticed any major degradation that you've seen or have things more or less relatively stayed positive? No, I wouldn't say it stayed positive. I'd say that many wetland areas in, in Florida and elsewhere have shown very obvious signs of degradation in the past, whatever. I've been here 40 years, so in that period of time. There's growing attention paid to the springs, which are important areas here. And uh, many of the springs, and I've worked a fair amount in springs with alligators. And, um, you know, we have silver springs down in Biocala. This is the largest spring in the world. And, and that place looks completely different now than it did when I first saw it in the early 1980s. The water is still clear, but it's not crystal clear like it was. The eel grass growing in that river now has filamentous algae growing all over it because there's nutrients coming into that water from uh, fertilizers, you know, used on lawns and, and the outflow from septic systems uh, is getting down into the water. And that's those are just nutrients that algae feed on. And, and that in turn changes the composition of the invertebrate population in those waters and, uh, and, and consequently the, the, um, the vertebrate predators that feed on those, including alligators, they feed on all of that. Uh, it changes the fish population quite a bit. And so, uh, you know, I can see those changes readily uh, when I'm in those areas. We've also seen in a, in a number of places where we've had very severe uh, uh, pollution from chemicals by fertilizers or pesticides. Uh, not just by normal applications of these. The classic example here for alligators is, uh, is Lake Apopka in just north of Orlando is surrounded by the Zellwood muck farms, which are famous for uh, the production of produce, but also cut flowers and things like that. And, and for decades, they've been applying fertilizers and herbicides and pesticides in those areas. And so the ground is just saturated with it and that runs off into the lake. And then we've had a couple of instances there and elsewhere where, we, where we've had quite severe spills of these chemicals that were, where the containment of those chemicals actually ruptured and you had, you know, uh, thousands of gallons of this being released into the environment. And so that's kind of uh, that and some other areas kind of led to this, uh, this relatively new uh, field of study called ecotoxicology, which is the impact of toxins on, on ecosystems and the, the organisms that live within them. Alligators were one of the, the first, you know, real canaries in the coal mine to show us those, those problems. We began again back in the 80s when we were beginning to collect these eggs uh, to go to farmers and they would hatch them out. Uh, we started realizing that these, uh, that many of the hatchlings, for instance, uh, in the Lake Apopka area, many of the eggs wouldn't hatch. Uh, 
those that did hatch had really poor performing babies. They were small when they got out of the egg and they just wouldn't grow. And uh, so you would have these runt alligators. You'd have three-year-old alligators in a grow out house, many of which were well over three feet. And you'd have these lake populators that were, you know, 15 or 18 inches long at most and just little scrawny things. Um, and so it was impacting those animals at a developmental level and was really impacting their whole physiology. And, um, and since then, we, there's been a lot of study done on alligators and these, and these toxins in the environment. And we know that, um, you know, that other animals in the environment are absorbing these chemicals as well. The fish population, the freshwater turtle population, the amphibians all have elevated levels of, of these chemicals in their, uh, uh, in their bodies as well as the alligators. Uh, and, and we know that, uh, that female alligators that have these elevated levels of chemicals in their body, which they've either absorbed directly from the environment by, by living in it, by uh, drinking the water from it, or by eating prey that have been swimming around in that same water, they've accumulated these uh, chemicals in their body. So we have this notion of bioaccumulation, alligators eating a bunch of fish with each with a, a small load of these chemicals ends up concentrating that into a large load. And so we now know that female alligators that have accumulated these, these toxins transfer those toxins to their eggs. And so, you know, the babe, the eggs and the developing babies inside are already dealt a really poor hand in life because they, they may, it may kill them. They may not develop properly. They may never hatch. Uh, uh, but, but when they do, they, they are not fit animals. You know, they're not really, they're not really going to do well and thrive in that environment. So these are these are problems that we see repeatedly. And you know, I know this isn't necessarily your exact field, right? But uh, uh, you know, as someone that does work, with, you know, outdoors a lot, and someone that is an expert, right? What do you think are the best ways to kind of mitigate kind of these issues that we're kind of seeing? You know, what what needs to be done on either a local, state, or federal level? So I think we need local, state, and federal help. Uh, to control these problems. Um, we need legislation to, to curb the use and, high, and more highly regulate the use of these chemicals. Uh, we need to uh, create situations by which runoff into natural waterways uh, is limited. Um, even from residential areas, not just agricultural areas, but, uh, but you know, any water that's going down a storm drain is going to end up in a waterway. And so we need, we need, we need regulation uh, for that as well. You know, they've, they've done a lot of work and spent a lot of money on Lake Apopka to try to get rid of as many of these dioxins and uh, other uh, toxic chemicals as as are in there, but they're you know they've settled down into the detritus on the on the sediment on the bottom of that lake, and so th they're literally going in there and pumping out the 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 bottom of the lake to collect as many of those chemicals as they can, so that they're not just constantly leaching out into the environment, being absorbed by the organisms that live there. Interesting. Um, and then, you know, and then kind of going off of that, right, you know, the million dollar question, you know, with climate change, you know, what, um, what role do you think climate change is playing in the background of all these issues? So climate change, um, at this point in our area, really seems to be influencing temperature 
more than anything else. Temperature and the, the frequency and severity of storms. Um, and so, you know, alligators have temperature dependent sex determination. The, the sex that, a, that an embryo within an egg develops into is determined by its incubation temperature. They can be females or, or males, just dependent on the temperature during a stage in their development. So as the environment gradually warms, we would expect a shift, um, you know, in the in the sex ratio of the of the little alligators that are hatching out. Many people have considered that to to be a real threat to alligators. Um, I, I mean, I understand that there's a potential for this being a, a serious issue. I'm much more concerned about crocodilians like our American croc where there are many fewer animals in the population and their, their nesting habitats are, are mostly coastal beaches. So if you have rising sea level, uh, you know, they may be inundated. And, and in general, those coastal beach uh, nesting sites are, that, that habitat is kind of rare anyway. I think in a, in a lot of places with American crocodiles, um, the, the amount of appropriate nesting habitat is really limiting the size of the population. And so that may just become more severe in the case of American crocodiles with uh, rising sea levels and rising temperatures. Alligators, there's a lot of alligators. There's a lot of wetland habitats. They can, you know, they can move and they can move their nests into more shaded areas. The population can, the northern limits of the population can shift north to cooler areas. Um, and maybe the southern limits of the population may move north as well. So and they may be they may alter their reproductive physiology so those those critical temperatures in, at which females are produced or males are produced are just shifted to somewhat higher levels just by natural selection so that sort of thing doesn't bother me very much some of the other predictions of climate change may bode more poorly for alligators you know the the expectation is that uh, the southeastern United States in the, you know, in the 50 years from, from uh, 2050 to 2100, we're probably going to have much less rainfall uh, than we have now in, in these areas. And so wetlands may dry. Uh, and those are critical habitats for alligators. So we, you may, you would, you would experience a decrease in alligator populations if, if the overall amount of wetlands in an area decreased. So it, it'll definitely have an impact. Um, I, I think they'll survive it, but, um, but it may give them some trouble for a while. So from my understanding, right, um, specifically with um, with the, I think, the American crocodile, as climate change is kind of happening, it's pushing the range northward. Would you mind elaborating on that a little bit more? Yeah, so we're already seeing, let me back that up. In alligators and crocodiles, there's a lot of... Um, negative social interactions between individuals in the population. Basically, adult animals are constantly, they're producing babies, they're taking care of babies. And then once those babies are no longer in their care, you know, they're as likely to eat them as care for them. And, the, and there's a lot of negative pressure uh, exerted by adult crocodilians on smaller individuals in the population. So there's always this pressure for young, for hatchlings and juveniles and sub-adults 
to move away from the areas where the adults are and find places to uh, where they can survive uh, and feed and grow until they're big enough to be recruited into an adult population. So there's this, this, um, this outward pressure um, on the population always. So we always have smaller animals, sub-adult animals that are wandering around, maybe pushing the limits of the range that we, we believe the range of the alligator, the range of the American crocodile is supposed to be. They're venturing beyond that just because they're looking for a place that they can survive. And so there are other things that limit that that movement or their ability to stay in those areas, right? Like like severe winters or the length of the cold, uh, the cold months of the year, which limits the number of warm months in which once they're adults, they can they can feed, they can build a nest, they can lay eggs, the eggs can hatch and grow a little bit before they have to shelter for the winter. But there's this constant kind of outward flow of animals from the population. And so we're already seeing that um, in alligators. We, we, we see uh, alligators showing up in, in southeastern uh, Virginia. Uh, we see animals. Um, in up in northern Alabama, we have animals expanding their range in Arkansas. We even have uh, a couple of places in Tennessee, which was never considered to be one of the range states of, of alligators. We have a couple of places where alligators are living there now, and and you know specimens are kind of continually showing up. Uh, we have um, a number of areas in, in Texas where they're expanding to the west. Uh, so they're, you know, they're moving past Dallas and Fort Worth and in, in those areas. Uh, so I would expect the same sort of thing to happen in other crocodilians as temperatures rise. Uh, that uh, especially like in the case of of American crocs, you know, the American crocs that are living in South Florida are the extreme northern limit of their range, of their natural range. They actually occur over a very broad area in the Caribbean and central and northern South America. So we're just the very northern limits of their range. And we know they're susceptible to cold. When we have uh, cold fronts that come into Florida that are powerful enough to extend down into South Florida, into the Everglades, we see crocodiles die from that cold. So they're going to be susceptible to the coldest temperatures. But if you have uh, increasing temperatures, if you have longer periods between those rare events when the cold does penetrate that far, you're going to have crocodiles moving uh, north and, and in fact, the crocodiles don't really occupy the original range that they occurred in before we wiped them out. Uh, we have just stray animals that are happening to venture up into northern Tampa Bay, where, where out crocs used to live. So I would expect at a minimum that those may continue to kind of reoccupy areas that they lived in historically. And we'll just and just to kind of give you know the viewer a little bit of a spatial scale, right? And it's probably at its height. What would you say is probably the largest extent that alligator is going to occupy? In? The largest uh, in what? Uh, um, at the height, right? Geographically speaking, right? What is the largest range uh, um, they occupy? In? So alligators now. Um, live everywhere that they lived historically before before their populations were wiped out mm -hmm. and and perhaps because in part of human intervention they've actually expanded that range a bit in fact in 
in, in the Carolinas. You know, alligators are animals that live in the coastal plains uh, of, the, of the southern Atlantic seaboard. And then they wrap around the Gulf states as well. Uh, and traditionally, they, they were just, just found in those coastal wetlands, lowlands. Uh, but in the Carolinas, we're already seeing alligators occasionally showing up in the Piedmont. So you're finding alligators living in rocky bottomed, cold, clear, fast moving streams, which is not a place that we expect to find alligators, but these are animals that are venturing away from their natal areas and just find, trying to find a place they can live where they're not gonna get killed by an adult alligator. And so they are, they're, living in the places where they were, were originally living, as best we know. It's not like when the first colonists moved to the New World, somebody immediately set off to chart the r range of distribution of the American alligator. We have to kind of piece that together from historical records and, and later from museum specimens and that sort of thing. So to the best of our understanding of what their original distribution was, they're in that area. Um, but I did mention that the Louisiana Wildlife uh, Commission, Wildlife and Fisheries, Department of Wildlife and Fisheries, uh, moved alligators from Louisiana into Arkansas, into uh, Missouri, into Alabama. Uh, and, and incidentally, about half of those animals that they moved, they were taking to private lands of farmers that asked to have alligators reestablished on their land because uh, of another ecological role. You know, they, they had muskrats and an introduced animal called a nutria that were digging through the dikes that they used to limit their, their, um, their uh, crop fields, the water irrigation of their crop fields. So they were ruining their irrigation by digging through that. And they knew alligators could control uh, uh, muskrat populations by preying on them. They control water moccasin populations as well. And so, um, you know, the Game Commission actually had quite a few private individuals asking them to bring alligators and establish them back on their areas. But they were bringing a lot of alligators. And I think over time, they kind of ran out of places to put them. So they started carrying them to places where we didn't know alligators existed before and just dumped them off, such as northern Arkansas. And, uh, and I think those animals have remained in those areas and begun to spread. So that, that range extension was probably human generated in large part. And those are probably the animals that we see venturing into Tennessee today. Those weren't, I don't think those were natural progressions of the, of the distribution of the alligator. I think that they had a little bit of human intervention in that case. Would you mind, um, just cause it's fascinating. Would you mind just briefly mentioning the relationship between alligators and water moccasin kind of regulation? <laughs> so, so moccasins live in, uh, in the same wetlands that alligators live in. And they tend to concentrate themselves in that emergent vegetation right along the edge of the wetlands, uh, which is exactly where alligators are feeding. And they're big and meaty. And, uh, and so alligators uh, commonly feed on water moccasins. Not, I mean, they're feeding on you know, non-venomous water snakes as well. They feed on rattlesnakes. They feed, you know, they, they feed on anything that, that looks like it might be food. Uh, but, but water moccasins, um, just by the, the place that they tend to spend most of their time, are kind of right in the crosshairs of alligators that are foraging or waiting in ambush for something to come down to the water's edge and, 
uh, and get a drink or whatever. So um, they do eat a lot of water moccasins. Interesting. Well, uh, um, that's it for me in terms of questions, unless you have anything more to add. Um, no, I think that's, I think we've covered a lot of information on, on alligators today. Yeah. Yeah.